Contrary to popular belief, the use of chemical substances and compounds in agriculture is really not a recent practice. The earliest records of use of pesticides dates back to, well, before Christ himself. With gas produced by burning elemental sulfur used to control pests in grain stores in ancient Egypt as well as the Roman Empire. Then let's fast forward to the 1840s when a chemist by the name of Liebig discovered that attacking uh, the use of by utilizing ashes uh, to attack plants and bones with sulfuric acid produced a phosphoric acid, which had a major impact in plant nutrition. Then on to World War I and World War II, a lot of the chemical compounds that were created during that era were utilized predominantly for military uses. Then, at the end of World War II, the United States directed much of the chemical production technology towards agriculture. Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Bill Smith, for FieldLink. Joining us today on FieldLink is Trey Baker. He is the Manager of Technology and Manufacturing Support. Plus, we'll be joined by Jody Lawrence from Nashville, Tennessee, to discuss how recent weather and international instability is affecting the commodity markets, as well as Jennifer Baer. Jennifer is the Manager of Formulation technology for the Helena Products Group. We'll deep dive into the importance of agriculture formulation and the impact that this trade plays in production agriculture. Stay tuned for FieldLink. Now joining us here on FieldLink is Trey Baker. Trey is the manager for technology and manufacturing support for the Helena Products Group. And Trey, welcome to FieldLink. Thanks, Bill. Good morning. Hey, you know, uh, Trey, glad to have you here today. Trey, you've you've been with Helena for for a number of years. Tell us a little bit about your background and your story. Uh, absolutely. Um, I'm in my 36th year with the company. Um, when I started, I started at the uh, the mothership is what we call is uh, the uh, Helena Chemical in West Helena, Arkansas. Wow. And I started as a chemist there. And uh, I was there for about five years. And then I moved to Memphis and been with HPG ever since. Wow. Um, at the time, it was about uh, just um, working in the lab and actually testing the products that we manufacture. And I, I really enjoyed that, but uh, to get into the meat and potatoes of things is once I got here, I got to learn about the formulations and started building them from scratch. And that was uh, that's my forte now, and that's what I really love to do. Wow. Uh, 36 years without... You've seen a lot happen in agriculture yes, over those years. Absolutely. Uh, you know... Technology has changed, mm-hmm. um, but we got to be able to adapt to that change, right? I mean, if we don't change, we're not going to ever do any better than what we are uh, yeah. to begin with. And so uh, Helen has done a really good job of uh, adapting to the change in the industry um, as a whole and uh, to providing that to the customer and, and educating them as well um, where, where needed. And uh, I think that's uh, a, a big part of uh, what's our success in the industry today. Wow. Trey, help, help us understand, our listeners understand, you know, the formulation process. Tell us, on a, a big scope, what does that necessarily mean to a grower? Well, you know, with today is the growers like the ease of use of products. Uh, in the old days, we'll go back to the beginning, is, is that, uh, you know, there were wettable powders, there were WDGs, mm-hmm. uh, there were suspension concentrates, or back in those days, we called them flowables. Okay. You know, that's uh, similar to the paint industry. That's where that technology come from. Um, those products were cheaper. Um, they were uh, highly concentrated. The downside was is that they had a lot of mixing problems, so they had a lot of baggage with them. Mm. But that was the time back then that the growers, that's what they had available to them, and it was uh, problematic. But at the same time is, is that uh, it was affordable. And then as technology changed, formulations changed, how could we make formulations better, easier to use, user-friendly? Mm-hmm. And that's where we got into, you know, emulsifiable concentrates. That's where the liquids came in more into play, where they actually emulsify into the spray tank or they're soluble liquids, which they, when you put them in the water, they're completely miscible. So you, you get away from mixing issues. Right. And... Uh, you don't have near the poundage of AI per gallon per se, but you still have the efficacy involved with these changes in the formulations to make them easier to be used. Wow. So at the end of the day, that formulation process makes it a little bit easier for growers that are at the end row, you know, uh, mixing products together. So they're, you know, having the issues. 
tanks and so forth. Absolutely, because in the old days, you know, it used to be where growers were putting so many different products in the spray tank to take care of every issue that they had. Mm -hmm. You know, they're still trying to limit those passes across the field based on fuel, you know, compaction in the soil. Whatever the, the issue may be is what they're trying to get rid of. And at the same time, you have either an antagonism or a synergy in that spray tank with every single component that you're putting in there. So with the complexes of the formulations today, you still have some of that, but technology has gotten better to where we don't have those problems that we had, say, 30 years ago. Wow. You know, speaking about 30 years ago when you first started in this business, what were some of the common challenges that you as formulators faced back then? Well, like I said earlier, is that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, everybody wants to put as much Mm -hmm. as they can in a single container. Okay. And um, the growers want to be able to put as many things in the spray tank to take care of every one of their issues, whether it be a fertilizer, nutritional product, along with the insecticide, with the fungicide, you know, with um, any other adjuvants or uh, tank mix components that they could get. Well, usually when you have that, you're going to have a an issue. You know, we can't mm-hmm. determine the physiological effect that's going to happen with all of these components in, in the spray tank at one time. So we can't answer efficacy at that point in time. We just know what the properties of each one of these products will bring to the table. Um, and you put climactic factors in there with it, and that that makes uh, a, a big challenge today, even. Wow, it's definitely evolving. So, what you know, in your thirty six years with Elena as a formulator, what 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 are some of the big advancements that I guess made your job easier and and, and uh, advanced the industry? Well, I think you know, along with new chemistries that have come along in the last uh, three decades. Uh, you know, even though we're still using some of the old AIs from the early days, um, you know, there were times where we were getting away from the pre-emergent applications and just mm-hmm. going to the singular um, burn down or the actual uh, post-application herbicides. Sure. And what today with what we're seeing with, uh, you know, so much uh, uh, issues in the field with... Um, Resistance and that sort yes. of thing? Uh, absolutely. With, with with the number of inst- of of those today, with numerous chemistries today, mm-hmm. we're having to go back to that pre-emergence, and that and it's important. It's you know it's uh, it's necessary. Right. You know it's one of those things where when we keep using the same thing over and over, and not changing the mode of action, you're going to build resistance. Right. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's an insect or if it's a plant. Um, and I think it's very important to put that back in the programs today, and we're seeing that. But we're also seeing more and more resistance to different sets of chemistries out there today. Right. And how do we make that better? How do we utilize uh, everything that we have at our disposal to be able to uh, combat that from a grower standpoint? You know, Trey, one of the things that we talked about earlier was uh, the manufacturing process, certainly the formulation in the laboratory, and you got a great team. Uh, tell us a little bit about your team, and then let's talk a little bit about manufacturing. Well, we, we, we do have a great team. Um, we have uh, a lot of different folks that, uh, that work in the laboratory. Um, if I think uh, the number is correct, I think we're looking at uh, 11 folks in the lab today. Hmm. Um, and that's grown over the years. Right. Um, everybody has a different experience uh, and expertise that they bring to the table. We have over 200 years of experience in that, in that department. Wow. And uh, everybody has different duties, but at the same time, it's a big team effort. And uh, that's from the time of things that come in the door to the time they go out the door to uh, building the formulations, uh, testing them, you know, stability-wise, active ingredient-wise. And then we're also supporting that manufacturing piece where we're actually taking the formulations, these recipes, standard operating procedures, Mm -hmm. and we're providing that knowledge to our manufacturing uh, plants to be able to manufacture the products to the specifications that uh, we provide for these formulations. And uh, they, they do a really good job across the country being able to do that so that we can bring quality to the product to the grower so that they can have a return on their investment when they utilize Helena products. Right. Those standard operating procedures are really in place to ensure the confidence to the grower that, hey, he or she's going to get the product that your team developed in the laboratory under the strict formulation processes. Absolutely. You know, when we uh, we, we have a large um, 
quantity of, of raw material suppliers that we purchase mm-hmm. from so that we have the best options for our manufacturing arm to be able to select from, which meets stringent specifications based on our daily evaluations of these raw materials to be approved to go into, a, say, an HPG product. Definitely a lot of processes in place that have to, you know, be met in order to provide that quality. Absolutely. And, you know, and on the other side of that, Bill, is that when we, uh, we're talking about the formulation itself, the recipe, mm-hmm. but we also visit our plants to make sure that they have the plant processes and capabilities to be able to manufacture specific products that we're needing to be manufactured in that area rather than just only in one select plant. So it's not just sending, you know, this facility, this plant, a manufacturing plant, here's our recipe, go make it. It's Here's the standard operating procedures, and we're going to come support that, boots on the ground, and help coach you through that process. Absolutely. That's uh, you know a big part of what we do as well. Uh, we want to be able to make sure that the plant can manufacture the product to the specs with the ease of, of being able to do so based on the capabilities that they have. Um, you know, as with any company, you, you have the opportunity to uh, invest in the pr- processes of the capabilities in the plants to be able to uh, increase volume of production or at least have different capabilities to make products that you previously were not able to manufacture because of you didn't have heating, you didn't have cooling, you didn't have uh, you know storage capacity. Wow. So we, we go in and do that piece for them as well, and we'll give them our, our recommendations and uh, at the end of the day, it's a win for Helma. Wow. A lot of complexity in that portion of the formulation process of, of, of a lot of these AIs. Yes, absolutely, because it just goes it, it goes further beyond just that bench work that we do in the lab. Mm-hmm. You know, we're taking it all the way to production, and that's, uh, that's a big piece of what we do. Wow. So, Trey, you know, in addition to uh, manufacturing support here domestically, you also and your team are also involved – on our international business. Tell us a little bit about that side of our industry. Sure. Um, You know, uh, Marabini is our um, parent company, Mm -hmm. and um, they're responsible for uh, product sales outside of the United States. And uh, we help them diligently in in trying to promote um, sales of those products that we manufacture here, uh, you know, domestically uh, for international sales. Unfortunately, we can't always be able to fit those products in that marketplace to where they want to sell because mm-hmm. of, you know, the extent of, you know, everybody's got their piece on it, and by the time it gets to the grower, it's too expensive. Right. Um, so what we've tried to do is, is figure out where we can help Marvini where we're making products in country. Mm-hmm. Um, in the past, that was not a possibility. Um, today, that is getting better. Uh, even though we're still manufacturing product and shipping it internationally for Marabini for the sales in those countries, uh, we are finding ways to manufacture product in country where they're closer to the market to the grower, and that is growing every day. And that's wow. a big part of uh, our business relationship with them outside the U.S. So in addition to international manufacturing, you're supporting our international team with uh, you know, some of the manufacturing that's slowly easing out outside of the United States. Absolutely. Um, so we support our global business development team here mm-hmm. um, that is responsible for those outside sales outside the United States. Uh, so we're giving them the same support that we do domestically here. It's going to be the recipe, the standard operating procedure, right. actually going to the plants where they intend to manufacture product, and also approving uh, raw materials that they're going to be purchasing closer to the market so they're not having to, to pull product from the United States. Absolutely. Trey, what are some common products that would kind of fall into that international market? What are a couple names that we might recognize? Well, we have a large portfolio of nutritional products. The, 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 the most common one, the most famous one, mm-hmm. I would say, is Coron. Okay. Uh, Coron is a big uh, product for us in the United States, but it's also uh, one of the biggest ones internationally. And then uh, probably in that neighborhood of uh, the next generation of uh, nutritional products is the Nucleus family of products. Mm -hmm. Nucleus Ophos would be an example one. Um, And then we're moving into uh, some adjuvants in some countries where the registrations are required for those for like uh, Agridex and Kinetic. 
Okay, excellent. It's definitely an evolving industry, you know, not just domestically but globally. So interesting uh, aspect for a formulator. Yes. And, and Trey, what are, uh, t- tell us about some of the unique products that you're working on for our international team. Well, one that we've developed here uh, a few years back is a product that we call Banana Film. Okay. Uh, Banana Film is, a, um, is an adjuvant that uh, has multiple features. And what's going on is like th- for a banana grower, like in Costa Rica and Ecuador and all, they're, they're actually making multiple spray applications during the season to take care of like Cigatoga, which is a, a, a fungus. Okay. And um, so it's hard to get these sprays um, even though there's numerous ones to take care of this control. So we've developed an adjuvant that helps with the synergy of the fungicide to be able to get it into the world of the plant at the growing point of the tree mm-hmm. so that uh, can help the growers limit the amount of applications that they have to make and make it more efficacious. So Banana Femme is a, a new product for us internationally that's taken off. I think what's really neat about that uh, story, uh, Trey, is, you know, here here in the United States, we get so pretty well locked into cotton, corn, soybeans, you know, and, and then some of our veggie crops as well. But to start hearing, you know, hey, we're playing in this international market with bananas, uh, that's that's just something that uh, you wouldn't think the average formulator in in the United States would even touch. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, it's like going to the grocery store and you see the bananas, you know, whether it be uh, Dole or if it's uh, another brand, is knowing that probably most likely is that Coron has been applied to the to the uh, banana crops in, in South America. Wow. Yeah. Interesting story. So, you know, what's what's the benefit of having uh, formulations taking place over, you know, across seeds? What are some of the challenges they're faced with? Well, as I said before, is right now or earlier on, it was a uh, product had to be manufactured in the United States. Right. And then it had to be transported from the U.S. to the foreign country. Um, a lot of the issues is, is that, you know, the timing involved in placing the order. How long is it going to take to manufacture the product? How are we going to get it there? What type of vessel are we going to use and how long is it going to take three, four, five weeks on the water to get to the country? Sure. And then you've got all these other challenges is that a lot of it is is that there's import tax, right? Mm-hmm. So you're bringing it into the port. It's going to have to be offloaded. you got to yep. pay that tax. And then uh, it's going to go to a distributor, you know, right. and uh, Marabini will, will, will set that up. And then what happens is is you take – all of that through that, that trade route, and it gets to the distributor. Now they're going to either repack it, and then it's ready for sale to the grower. And by the time it gets to him, it's it's uh, very expensive. Yeah. So, uh, again, that's why we were talking earlier about w- where can we take some of these shortcuts and, and, and get it to the grower faster and cheaper so that uh, it doesn't take as long. And that's what uh, the other piece of what we're trying to help Marbini with, with making products in country. Yeah, and the goal is to obviously make things more efficient and effective uh, for the grower. Absolutely, and have it there when he needs it. Right, absolutely. And, and, and you mentioned uh, Costa Rica, and you mentioned uh, what, what are some of the unique calls that you've taken from an international business over the years? Well, uh, you know, a lot of times the guys will, will, will call in and they'll say, hey, listen, I've got a problem here. It's just the like same way we have here in the U.S. Yeah. is we're mixing this and this and this. And the, the, the real challenge that we have sometimes there is that we don't have the products that per se are being sold there in that country. They're mm-hmm. called something else. You know, right. they're, they're not called touchdown and they're not called roundup. Right. You know, there's, there's a different chemistry there. And uh, that's kind of hard for us to answer those when we don't have that product. Gotcha. And so uh, a lot of times what we're doing is educating those guys how to actually do that jar test evaluation. What's the best mix and order addition for all of the, the products that he's going to be using on that cropping system? And then what are the lookouts? What are the watchouts? So he has to take care of the seed to make sure that if there's an issue, mm-hmm. then we're going to have to start identifying which one is the antagonistic product or can we change the addition order or do we just completely leave it out of the mix? Wow. Well, Trey Baker, thanks for joining us. And clearly a lot of... Uh, Moving parts in the world of formulation and, and, and you know, con- kind of an often an overlooked area of the industry um, that's very important to every grower out there that's mixing any kind of product in his or her tank. Absolutely. 
Thanks for joining us, Trey. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate it. Joining us uh, from Nashville, Tennessee, is Jody Lawrence. Jody, welcome to FieldLink. Thank you, Bill. It's good to be back uh, out on the road, going to a lot of uh, uh, field days and field knowledges and looking at a wide variety of topics and uh, as, as far as new products and results from those products, and then also a wide variety of yields. We've been in Indiana and Illinois this week. Next week will be Nebraska, which I expect to uh, kind of tamp down my enthusiasm for the Illinois and Indiana and Ohio crops. But uh, it's nice to get on the road this time of year to see everything with your own eyes. Definitely a lot of different uh, varying crop conditions out there, uh, Jody. Uh, I know you've been talking a lot to a lot of growers from across the entire U.S. Uh, what are you kind of hearing and picking up from some of those growers? Well, the Eastern Corn Belt, and this year I'm describing the Eastern Corn Belt as everything from Des Moines East, basically Des Moines to you know, Toledo, Ohio, obviously it goes further east than that, but the, on the major production side, it, because that's really kind of where the dividing line is. The only, uh, you have western Iowa that is still, uh, wish they could have gotten the finishing rain, still have a chance for some because they several spots got some decent ones. But when you start looking at eastern Nebraska, uh, southern and southeast, Iowa, there are some big holes in uh, in the crop in some very, very historically productive states. So it's, it's going to be interesting what uh, we see from the crop tours this week and just uh, when harvest starts to get rolling here in the next uh, four to six weeks in the Southern Corn Belt. Yeah, definitely a, a lot of variability out there right now. Uh, uh, you know, the Mid-South and, and the Delta getting an awful lot of rain. Uh, still pretty dry uh, in certain parts of the very far west, but they're picking up some big rains occasionally. But uh, uh, a wide varying amount of conditions out there. Uh, Jody, the Pro Farmer Tour, I believe, starting. Uh, uh, w- what are we picking up from that group right now? Uh, started today, and I was looking for tweets and kind of insight and where the opposite end started, uh, one of them in Illinois, one of them in Nebraska. So clearly, uh, they are seeing two different crops. And as expected, the, the tweets I've seen, I haven't seen a lot of them, and they've not come out with their nightly results yet. But you're getting a wide variety. And uh, I think there is a just reading into some Uh, quotes about tip back and some other things from the Eastern Corn Belt, Indiana and Illinois, that it's uh, another year of uh, the hall of a very good crop, but not a hall of fame crop. While Nebraska uh, got hurt so badly with in June and July when they got limited moisture and brutal heat, and they still have some brutal heat going on right now that uh, their conditions are going to continue to struggle, and we'll see that when they get uh, when they get harvested. Uh, once the combines start rolling, certainly a, a lot of you know stories out there as it relates to weather and performance of these multiple crops out there. Jody, how's that starting to impact uh, some of the grain markets uh, from your perspective? Well, the weather, the biggest thing, and I realize this. I'm going to talk about Mon- Monday, August 22nd's trade. Today, we had we have very, very, very strong old crop markets, and that to me has been an important issue all summer. Why the uh, when we got rains that the markets were able to bounce back because there's a lot of internal demand, high margins from the crusher, the bean crushers and from the ethanol grinders and e- ethanol exports that we've talked about previously. But today's rally, when you have a variety of really bearish factors, gives me some hope that we're, uh, I, we're going to see another abnormal year because everybody thinks, oh, well, once we get started in harvest, the markets and that's, uh, almost always go down. I think we are starting to see uh, and we saw that last year or uh, last week and last year, 
that you everything gets priced in a little quicker simply because the availability of information uh, through Twitter and through everybody's smartphone happens so much faster with, you know, the Dow had a terrible day today. Crude oil is pulled back again on uh, recession fears. But then on the other side of the coin, you have China involved in their worst drought, their 2012 uh, almost all of Europe's involved in uh, a historical drought. You've got rivers that major characters, the, the Yangtze and the Rhine, that are as if not more important to their commerce and their uh, just general health of their economy as the Mississippi is to the U.S. And they're dried up to a point where very limited barge and the lowest uh, many people can sit, have seen in generations. So we got a lot of world issues. Argentina, you can throw them in there. Uh, so you can't just focus and say, well, it rained in Illinois. The, uh, the price should be going down. It's, it's just not that type of year because you've got a lot of balls in the air on uh, crop and yield potential variability and uh, the ongoing political issues that we're having with Ru- with Russia and Ukraine, and they began bombing uh, closer and closer to Odessa and are hiding a lot of their munitions that are holding out offensive assaults around uh, Ukraine's largest nuclear plant. So you're, you're really in a catch-22 that uh, everybody wants to uh, – you know, I think you know everybody who wants to see this war in quickly wants the humanitarian, the humanitarian corridor to to work and to be good. But we're what we're one or two poorly placed bombs at the port of Odessa and a couple other ports by Russia, shutting all that back down again. And we'll be uh, it may not be quite as exciting as it was in February, but there's certainly from these levels down here is very little war risk in these prices if Ukraine and Russia are completely shut off from the world the second half of the year. Yeah, definitely a lot of turmoil uh, across that region and in an ever-changing day-to-day uh, and certainly having an impact on the grain markets as well as distribution of food uh, around the world. Uh, Jody, uh, let's talk a little bit about harvest. Uh, uh, things are starting to kick in a little bit in the south. Uh, of course, some rains delayed some of that. Uh, what, what are you hearing from your clients in the south? That uh, the hot, dry summer uh, – June in particular, June and July, when large areas of the of the Delta, and I'll consider the Delta, you know, Louisiana, Arkansas, uh, Tennessee, all the way over, you know, South Carolina, Florida, some of the big produ- big production states in the South, that uh, hot dry for too long, more very vari- more variability. The crop has certainly rebounded sharply with the rains that we've seen in August, uh, with beans having the most upside potential, but the corn was uh, burned out early in a lot of places. So corn's gonna, corn yield's gonna be down in the Delta in the Southeast, but bean potential's still there. The issue right now that the rain is causing, and we saw it today, is when you shut off beans that are expected to be to the market by middle, late August, from the Delta harvest and the cash markets, then uh, you're really looking at a, a scenario where the cash pipeline is very empty, has been for a while, and the people looking for beans and corn the, are really paying top, top dollar. Some of the best basis we've seen since 2012, 2013. Speaking of that part of the country, uh, Jody, uh, the cotton market, we've seen a lot of movement here in the last uh, week or so. What's going on in the world of cotton right now? Well, cotton is the battle of the haves and the have-nots. And it's really, you could almost make the argument it's a whole bunch of have-nots because Texas and a majority of the U.S. crop was completely devastated by uh, the worst drought ever. A, a lot of cotton uh, seed got in the ground and never even came up. There was never even any beneficial rain to at least get it to sprout. But as the crop in the U.S. fell sharply, so did uh, China's consumption and the mills availability or the 
the mill's ability to sell to China because of the COVID restrictions, the recession concerns, and you're seeing an evening out of that because cotton is put on 20 cents just in the last week to 10 days of trading from those recession worry lows and the COVID zero tolerance that you really get, you really get to a spot when this market comes, when cotton gets to a point where it's just worried about the lost U.S. production, we can easily go back and revisit the highs that we saw over the winter in that 140 to 150 area. And I think December closed somewhere in the 113 to 115 range today. Definitely a lot of movement in that area, and that's something cotton growers want to really pay attention to as we, you know, transition into that harvest time uh, stage. Uh, Jody, want to thank you for your time today for joining us here on FieldLink, and uh, we certainly look forward to having you join us on our next episode. All right, Bill, thank you. And for everybody that's starting harvest, please be safe and take care of yourselves. Joining me here on FieldLink is Jennifer Bear. Jennifer is the manager of formulation technology for the Helena Products Group. Jennifer, welcome to FieldLink. Thanks, Bill. How are you today? Awesome. Great. It's good to see you. Great. Good to see you. Jen, uh, you got, before we dive into formulations and some of the things you do in the laboratory with your team, tell us a little bit about you. Where's home? Oh, home is Charleston, South Carolina. I mean, I'm, I'm, Currently living in Memphis, but that's my hometown. Yeah. Yeah. Um, College of Charleston was my alma mater before uh, going to um, Iowa State. Wow. So you uh, and you went to Charleston, Iowa State, and you've lived around the world, haven't you? I have. Um, I went to uh, college really briefly for a minute. For a minute, I yeah. attended Pontificia Universidade Católica in São Paulo, Brazil. In Brazil. Yes. Awesome. So I didn't have a love of chemistry yet, yeah. um, and uh, but I got my love of chemistry in Brazil. Did you? Yeah. Okay. Um, I had a I had a, um, a chemistry professor at um, at a pre course like a precursor to university, um, okay. and uh, it's the it's the course you take when you're gonna um, take their vestibular, which is their um, like their SATs. Okay. And uh, he was this chemistry professor was so fantastic that I would show up on a Saturday. I would show up on a Friday night for class. I would show up any time he had wow. class. He was just amazing. So um, uh, he gave me the bug, and, um, uh, and, and that's where it all started. I, had a, I was uh, living with a family. I was uh, briefly in an exchange program there, and uh, living with a family, and he, the gentleman who, um, for whom, with whom I lived had a, a, a very small mom-and-pop surfactant Factory, okay. and he made dishwashing detergent. Wow! And uh, so uh, he he was inspirational because I got to see that manufacturing side of it, and it was a real small mom mm-hmm. and pop. Like you could put the whole manufacturing plant probably in my lab. Wow! Yeah. Wow! Interesting beginnings. So uh, let's fast forward to today. Sure. Um, you, today you uh, work uh, for the Helena Products Group. Tell us about your role here. Um, as manager of formulation technology, and I have like a f- small regulatory support role here as well. Um, I design, for the most part, um, our insecticides, fungicides. Right now, we're really focusing on flowables. I design our um, our adjuvants. Um, I do I do some herbicide um, design, but that's really not what I'm working on okay. this year. Mostly, mostly flowables, mostly insecticides and fungicides this year. All in the formulation space. Yeah, it's wow. a great space. It's a great gig if you can get it. So you know we hear the term formulation thrown around a lot, but you know to the average grower, to the average person out there, what break, break down formulation? What does that really mean? Well, in my space, I've heard them refer to it anywhere from uh, a black art to kitchen chemistry. <laughs> Is that so, right? So um, we take that active ingredient and um, ask ourselves what we're focusing on, what the intent of that active ingredient is to the grower, and um, look at the adjuvants that um, are most aligned with that active ingredient, and then try to create a product that um, in the VAP space Mm -hmm. um, would include um, some, uh, would include the adjuvant, um, would be a very intentional design um, with the uh, expectation that the product look really, you know, really great in the can, um, be hassle-free, 
when it goes into the tank mm -hmm. and, um, and be optimized for the grower. No, so basically you're really trying to bring complex compounds together to make it simple for the grower. Yes, keeping it simple. That's the important part, keeping it hassle-free. Well, and a part of that simplicity is compatibility. And that's that's another big term that gets thrown around. But, uh, you know, at the farm gate a lot of times, this product's not compatible. What does compatibility mean? And wh what are some of the steps that you take to, I guess, eliminate that compatibility issue challenge? Sure. So um, we might ha we'll have a conversation on the front end with our R&D people and talk about um, what the most common tank mix partners are mm -hmm. and um, what range of water hardnesses across the country um, will be impacted. And then um, we'll do some pre-screening as a part of the development process, um, looking maybe at, um, at competitive products as our benchmark, if necessary. Sure. Um, and and so when as I'm going through developing a product for us, I'll keep revisiting that tank mix. So does it need to look good um, in in 32? Does it need you know? Is it always going to go out with MSO? Will this product um, go out always with a? Is this insecticide always going to go out with a fungicide? By way of example, and uh, look at the crops that it'll be in, you know impacted, and that way I can determine my use rate in in my simulated tank mix. Mm -hmm. Um, and as I'm developing, I'll look at it and say, oh, it might need, it might need this special ingredient to help it, um, blend better with, um, with a fertilizer. And my, my, um, end game, my end goal for it is to, um, to be a homogenous, for the whole tank mix to be a, a homogenous, um, system that unfolds um, from the top of the cylinder to the bottom of the cylinder in the laboratory. And what that looks like for the grower is that from the top of the spray tank to the bottom of the spray tank, we have um, a uniform, consistent system so that when she goes to apply it to the field, um, what she first applies going out onto the field is uniform and consistent with what she applies at the end. Mm -hmm. And um, without that compatibil without a compatibilizer in the system, uh, you might end up with uh, a lot of active at the front end or a lot of fertilizer at the front end and a lot of MSO at the back end or all right. the lighter problem um, products at the back end. We're trying to eliminate crystal issues sure. as well. Um, I don't, I don't want to get a complaint about crystals in, the, in nozzles. Oh, especially uh, around May 15th when <laughs> growers are going hard and trying to get, you know, acres covered. Yeah, exactly. Y the work you and your team are doing ahead of time to create, you know, these, these awesome formulations eliminates some of that stuff. That's the intent. Absolutely. Once we've, once we've made a formula that we, we think looks great on the front end and we've tested it in storage for six weeks or so in a mm -hmm. variety of temperatures, we'll go back and revisit that tank mix again with those products to see if okay. with time and temperature stress, it still holds up to the rigors of a multitude of tank mix partners. Well, and I think that's a really great point when you talk about storing uh, a product like, you know, a chemistry and then going through this hot temperatures that we may have down, for example, parts of our, uh, you know, trade territory in Arizona and Yuma, uh, all the way up to Fargo, North Dakota, for example. There's a lot of, it could be the same product, but how does it react in one part of the country to the other? That's a part of some of the formulation that your team is, you know, evaluating. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Very important side of things for growers to, uh, you know, certainly experience. So, um, how does your team typically go about tackling some of these types of issues? Can you walk us through that process a little bit? Sure. Um, it's a group effort. Um, we don't do it. Uh, we don't do it in isolation. Mm -hmm. We have lots of conversations on the front end with our R and D team um, and our brand managers. Brand managers, you know, giving us an idea of their vision mm -hmm. for a product. Our R and D team telling us what they um, what they see as uh, common issues in the field. And, um, and then when we get together, we talk about what, um, what solvents will improve on the product, you know, will sure. improve its stability and cold temperatures okay. um, for formulations. Uh, it's all about solubility. Everything has to blend well together. Um, and uh, then we'll look at um, what components we can put in to 
uh, reduce evaporation if that's necessary, to keep an active ingredient soluble on the cuticle of a leaf if mm -hmm. necessary. Um, what do we need to add, you know, by way of a wetter, if this is a product that's going to go into the soil, right. for example, we need to open up those, you know, open up the, the pore spaces, get into the soil so we can get closer to um, the roots, sure. the root system. Um, that's really how the conversation goes. We look at the active ingredient, ask ourselves, what solvents does it need? Does, you know, what features um, benefit this um, active on the crop? Mm -hmm. Wetters, do we need spreaders? Do we need an anti-evaporant? Wow. A lot of complexity, a lot of different things to look at and consider in developing these uh, formulations. So, Jennifer, what, uh, in your opinion, what does the future look like? Uh, do you foresee more formulations coming forward in agriculture? Uh, do you see some challenges there? Give us your two cents there. Well, I'm really excited about the idea that biopesticides are coming down the okay. way. There will always be a space, um, a dominating space, I think, for conventional chemistries. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, biopesticides open the door to um, new active ingredients, new modes of action, um, uh, niche crops to right. work on. Um, and I think that we'll that that's, um, space will move out of the niche crop space and become um, uh, more conventional with time. Right. That's uh, that's the place that I'm most excited about for the future. Yeah, I think you're right. I think uh, those biopesticides will continue to evolve. Um, you know, they're becoming more and more popular in, you know, smaller markets, vegetable markets, and specific crops. But, sure. you know, over time, as we learn more, as we, I guess, gain more insight uh, in this space, um, we can expect to see some additional pesticides in the future sure. for, you know, the common cotton, corn, soybean uh, markets that we're, we're pretty used to here in the United States. Yeah, and, and multi-active um, combinations of pesticides, uh, it's a fun challenge for the laboratory to work on. Um, we don't, uh, we approach it really excitedly, like, oh, this is going to be great for us. We're going to be challenged with uh, new technology platforms. New stuff to experience, new, new tools, too. Tell us a little bit about some of that area that no, no, it might be unique and different. You know, we have um, we have great suppliers. Um, we have a great supplier relationship um, with uh, our laboratory, and um, so they uh, they give us the flexibility to come to them and say, "Hey, um, I need the molecule to be bent this way. Um, I need the molecule to um, be modified because um, my end result." in the spray tank um, needs to have a, a particular look. And um, our supplier relationships are allowing us to do that. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, there are 1,500, 2,000 raw materials on the inert ingredient list that we wow. can exploit right now. And so I don't always necessarily need new chemistry. I just need to know how to take full advantage of the candy store that's available to me. Sure. 1,500 to 2,000 are available to you today. Yes. Wow. And, and then, then you break that down to different, I guess, proportions, uh, combinations. The it, permutations are endless. It's endless. It is. Wow. That's amazing. Jennifer Bear, I want to thank you for joining us here today on Field Link and uh, sharing your insight about formulation and some of the insight that takes place here at the Helena Products Group inside the laboratory. And uh, we appreciate uh, your contribution to agriculture. Thanks so much for having me. I want to thank all of you for joining us here on this episode of FieldLink as we learn about the power of formulation and how formulation of agricultural chemistry can impact growers' bottom line. Thanks for joining us for this episode of FieldLink.